Picture this. It was an ordinary day at Los Angeles Union Station. Trains were halting, unloading their cargo, uncoupling, recoupling cars, as the passengers patiently waited for their train to arrive. But the day only seemed ordinary, as unbeknownst to most, there was one train that wouldn't halt. Rather, it just kept on going, ramming through the bumping post and jumping the tracks before it broke through a concrete barrier, stopping just short of falling onto the street 20 feet below. And remarkably, this was far from the only case of its type. Today, we'll examine the stories of runaway trains and their aftermath. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Our first story starts at approximately 8.45 a.m. when the Santa Fe No. 19 arrived from Chicago to Los Angeles' Union Station. The Santa Fe Railway Super Chief locomotive was uncoupled from its El Captain passenger train when it started to roll down the tracks. And this is where the problem started. You see, after decoupling, Fred Hurst, the train engineer and driver, followed the station trackmaster's instruction to ease his cars towards the bumping post, reverse through the crossover, and head to the roundhouse through the release track. Along the way, the brakes for the Santa Fe failed, causing it to continue forward, slowly rolling at around 2 to 3 miles per hour. This is when the 150,000-pound leading car smashed through the steel bumping post and jumped the tracks, where it clipped an army motor pool. Luckily, the 19-year-old driver who had come to pick up passengers from the station reacted quickly and floored the vehicle, coming away with a slight push to the side. From there, the train continued over the paved road until it collided with the one-foot-thick concrete wall lining Alizo Street in downtown LA. With the lead car finally stopped on its battery case and fuel tank, although its front wheels dangled above the street and over a 20-foot drop, astonishingly, the train's nose was straining against the wires of a Pacific electric pole, which had been snapped in the process. Hurst had remained at the controls the entire time and carefully escaped through the back of the train, but his fireman, Frank Rittenhouse, abandoned the vehicle as soon as he realized something was wrong. Thanks to the help of a 250-ton crane, the locomotive was pulled back onto the tracks and taken to the roundhouse for repairs just five hours after the crash. Considering the cinematic nature of the aftermath, this train crash was front page news the following day, sporting a picture of the train held by the utility pole. The cause of the crash was unknown at the time, but an investigation later found that Hearst had accidentally turned off the train's MU2A valve, releasing the engine's air brake control. Hearst was ultimately found at fault for the crash and was permanently removed from service. But the drama wouldn't end there. In a run of bad luck, after the accident, the El Captain was derailed on October the 30th, 1949, near Azusa, California. The eastbound train struck a broken rail while traveling between 60 and 70 miles per hour, causing it to roll over and catch fire. Thankfully, only one crew member and 17 passengers walked away with minor injuries. The locomotive was later repaired and returned to service, eventually rebuilt to become the number 2622 in the 1970s CF7 program. The train continued to shuttle passengers across the country until it was sold to the short line Louisiana and Delta in the 80s before it was finally retired in June of 1987. There have been many train incidences of this kind throughout history, and on at least one account, a derailment nearly caused major issues for an incumbent president of the United States. The Pennsylvania Railroad, number 4,876, Union Station wreck in Washington, D.C., involved train number 173, also known as the Federal Express, which had left Boston late the evening of January the 14th, 1953, bringing people to D.C. for Dwight D. Eisenhower's first inauguration. The train stopped in Rhode Island due to a closed anglecock, a pneumatic component that controls the brakes of each car behind it. After a delay of 56 minutes, the problem was found, and the anglecock was opened, and the train continued to New York, where it left with engineer Henry Brower behind the controls. The Federal Express made several stops on the way to D.C. with no trouble, 
breaking 14 times between New York and Baltimore, where the fourth car was decoupled and the train continued. Leaving Baltimore that morning, Brower set the controls for 80 miles per hour and did not apply the brakes until the train was two miles from Union Station. But to his shock and surprise, they had no effect. And hence, he pulled the emergency brake, which should have brought the train to an immediate halt, but it didn't. And train number 173 was now a runaway, heading downhill towards a dead end at the terminal with no brakes. Brower stayed behind the controls, repeatedly blowing the horn, warning everyone away from the track. The operator in the Union Station Tower heard the horn blast and notified the station master that a runaway train was coming towards the station. Accordingly, the concourse was quickly cleared before the Federal Express rocketed into the station, crashing through the buffer stop and flying onto the concourse. The train slid across the floor towards the waiting room, demolishing the main newsstand along the way. The leading number 173 and two train cars fell into the basement baggage room where the floor gave out. In all, 87 people were injured in the crash, but fortunately, no one was killed. This was no doubt thanks to the actions of the railroad crewmen. If it weren't for their quick and competent actions, more people indeed would have been injured or even killed. The cause of the crash was determined to be a closed angle cock on the fourth car that wasn't opened when they uncoupled the previous fourth car in Baltimore, preventing the remaining 16 train cars from breaking leading to this crash. With Eisenhower's inauguration just days away and thousands of visitors scheduled to arrive, time was of the essence. The repairmen quickly rebuilt the station, removing the cars that had fallen by the floor by just 7 a.m. the next day. Somewhat oddly, however, number 173 was left in the baggage room and a temporary floor was built over it, allowing the station to open just three days after the accident. After the inauguration, 173 was cut into three pieces, removed from the station and later reassembled at the Altoona workshops of the Pennsylvania Railroad, where it was painted Tuscan red and returned to service, lasting another 30 years as one of the last going 173s before it was finally retired in 1983. And since we've moved up to more modern times, let me tell you about a spectacular wreck that happened in Chicago about a decade ago. The CTA has had its share of crashes. Perhaps most famous of them are remembered by these haunting images of L cars knocked off their elevated tracks. However, in more modern times, a crash occurred and was recorded at the terminal station of the Blue Line. It all went down on the morning of March the 24th, 2014 when the Blue Line train wrecked at O'Hare International Airport. This was due to the train operator falling asleep before entering the station and failing to slow down soon enough. She didn't wake again until after the train smashed through the bumper at the end of the line. From there, the eight-car train jumped onto the sidewalk and was sent barreling up an escalator, leaving spectators to run for their life and causing millions of dollars in damages and injury to more than 30 people. Since then, at least two passengers have settled damage claims with the CTA, totaling at more than $10 million. The train operator, Brittany Haywood, began working with the CTA less than a year before the accident. She was hired in April of 2013 and entered a training program for operators that October, becoming a qualified professional in January and was somewhat inexperienced before the crash. But according to sources, this was not the first time that Haywood fell asleep at the wheel. A month prior, she admitted to dozing off and passing a station without stopping. Haywood would typically fill in for other operators, causing her hours to vary. This probably contributed to the crash, as she began her shifts at 10 p.m., working and sleeping irregularly and operating the train throughout the night before the fateful crash that morning. After the accident, she was designated the status of, quote, injured on duty and interviewed by officials, with plans to take actions once the interview was complete. The crash caused the National Transportation Safety Board to launch an investigation. They reviewed the collision, which was caught by over 40 surveillance cameras, where they discovered other faults, 
such as the emergency stop, which should have automatically stopped the train when it entered the station without slowing down. The speed limit while entering the station is 25 miles per hour and immediately drops to 15 once inside. You see, the train entered the station at 25 miles per hour, but wasn't stopped in time. Hence, ultimately, the NTSB found that all mass transit agencies, including the CTA, should better address driver fatigue when scheduling their motormen, and that the emergency stop was appropriately activated, but failed to stop the train and prevent the crash. In the months after this incident, the CTA implemented changes in scheduling of rail operators, adopting new rules that are some of the strictest in the nation. It should be noted here that this type of situation is not unique to Chicago or even the United States. Over in Europe, on November the 2nd, 2022, a metro train outside Rotterdam was moving along elevated tracks when it rammed through a stop block at the end and flew off the rails. Luckily, rather than succumbing to a 30-foot drop, the train was saved by an enormous whale tail sculpture that just so happened to be beside the tracks. The only person on board, the train operator, was able to escape from the crash and walk away with no injuries. Upon hearing of the crash, the sculpture's creator, architect Martin Stooges, was utterly shocked that his creation could support the weight of a 20-ton train engine. He designed the two whale tails almost 20 years ago, in 2002, matching the accurate scale of a blue whale's tail. What's more interesting is that one of the tails contains an internal steel structure, but as fate would have it, that's not the tail that the train landed on. Instead, it hit the hollow tail, consisting solely of six millimeter thick plastic, which could support the runaway train's impact and weight. And adding even more irony to this, the sculpture is aptly named Save by the Whale's Tail, which riffs on the idea of the tail track where the trains park at the end of service. After the crash, an official investigation was launched to determine how the train's safety features could have failed. A police interview of the conductor found no indication that he had done anything wrong. So upon further investigation, it was found that the train broke the metro speed limit before crashing into the sculpture, contributing to the derailment. At the time of the accident, the train traveled at 57 kilometers per hour when the speed limit was 35. Not to mention that rain and the driver's reaction time were also key factors. After the accident, the company responsible for public transportation in the area put new safety measures in place, making it technically impossible for a similar accident to happen, even going as far as removing the lane from service. The driver, who was accused of braking too late, was dismissed. Our final story takes us back to 1895 and is perhaps one of the most well-known. On October the 22nd, 1895, the Granville Paris Express left Granville and was engineered by Marie Pillerin, just 19 years old. It left on time at 8.45 a.m., but as it made its 7-hour and 10-minute journey, Pillerin discovered that the train was running several minutes late. To make up for the time, the engineer approached Guermont Panasse in Paris at a cruising speed between 25 and 35 miles per hour. This required him to use the Westinghouse air brake to stop the train safely in time, but when he tried to apply the brake, it was faulty or ineffective. The only option left was to pull the locomotive handbrake, but the conductor was preoccupied with paperwork and only pulled the brake after the train had crashed through the buffer stop. The locomotive brakes weren't enough to stop the train, so after it plowed through the buffer stop, the train crossed the almost 100-foot-long station and crashed through a 24-inch thick wall before falling 33 feet onto its nose. Miraculously, all 131 passengers survived, as all the passenger cars remained inside the station. Only the locomotive's forward luggage cars were damaged, leaving only two passengers and three crewmen suffering severe injuries. Unfortunately, a woman in the street below was killed by falling brickwork. She was standing in front of her husband, a newspaper vendor, while he went to collect that night's paper. In the aftermath, the conductor was fined 25 francs for not pulling the handbrake in time, while the engineer was fined 50 francs and sentenced to two months in jail. More than a century later, Prints, posters, and photos of the wreckage commemorate what is perhaps the most iconic train derailment in history, 
With that being said, it seems that runaway trains are a story as old as trains themselves. And even before that time, we had the runaway omnibus. Which perhaps could be a story idea for another video. Speaking of, I'd like for you to submit your ideas to our new email contact made available in the description or written here on the screen. Please send a short topic description and attach a small image for reference. Additionally, if you have a story to tell, get in touch. I'd like to interview you on our other channel, It's History On Air. I'm pretty curious to see what you guys come up with, and of course, I thank you all for supporting the project. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.